Cool. And uh, let's, let's get all the way back here to Zach, not to be confused with Zach. Um, it reminded me because he originally presented for us uh, in, the, in the intro session when we were at the chair box and actually when Andy and Scott were presenting there, uh, Holly Moon. So uh, let's hear it for Zach Johnson. All right. So I'm going to talk about uh, basically web-based game development. Um, and, uh, you know, we saw some pretty sweet stuff from E3 today. Uh, with uh, WebGL coming out, which I'll talk a bit, a bit later, um, WebGL is a, a basically open GL for the browser. Some of this really fancy stuff is going to start to be possible. Um, I, Google's already ported Quake 2 to WebGL, for instance. So you're kind of, a, you know, about that level in, in kind of it's getting faster uh, every month. But for the most part, uh, this is kind of more casual game, flash game kind of territory is where the web's at now. It's, it's definitely um, not, not any worse than flash at this point. It's completely caught up to flash um, in terms of performance. I'd, I'd say that pretty confidently. So just to kind of set it up, uh, it's not, I don't know if I'd call it a hardcore platform quite yet, but anyway. All right, so what does HTML5 have to do with video games? Uh, and, and what the hell is HTML5, right? So uh, mostly and, and specifically HTML5 is a markup language. It's just, you know, there was HTML4 before that and there was XHTML. It's just the new markup language, um, you know, and so there's some new tags. There's a canvas tag I'll talk about, audio, video, and then there's things like article, nav, header, footer. They've just extended the language by adding tags. But when people talk about HTML5, they, they use it as a marketing buzzword that means these new tags like Canvas and Audio, but they're also grouping into that CSS3, which is uh, cascading style sheets. It's a, a way to describe things visually uh, in the browser. And then they're also kind of putting in that bucket a, a highly optimized uh, JavaScript engine because all the browsers now have like just-in-time compiling and all these other tricks that they've pulled out. So JavaScript's extremely fast now. Um, which didn't used to be the case. And can you actually uh, use this stuff now? So a lot of people like to talk about all these cool things that browsers are doing, but you can't use them in Internet Explorer, you can't use them here, you can't use them there, they don't work. So I'll, I'll kind of cover that. Um, and yes, you can use this stuff now, that's, that's the good news. And I'm going to start with Canvas and with audio. So the audio tag, um, well, it lets you play audio, big, big surprise there. So you can do background music for your game, you can do sound effects for your game, you have volume control and you can do multiple channels and stuff simultaneously. But it's pretty basic and it's just a generic, you basically have a generic JavaScript API to deal with your audio for your game. You, you don't have like a lot of control over doing like pitch shifting and, and some of the really low level stuff. Um, Firefox has an API for that, but that's like, again, that's like one browser that does it. But if you want cross browser support, you basically just have, you know, you shoot your gun, it makes a bang sound, the guy screams, and you have, you know, background audio, that kind of thing. And then there's this canvas tag, which is really what's kind of enabled um, a whole new slew of games to be possible in, in JavaScript and, and not use Flash. Um, and that, the canvas takes a 2D drawing surface. It's really low level. You can do direct pixel manipulation if you want. And then they have higher level functions for doing paths um, that you can stroke and fill and that you can do images and circles and, and all sorts of stuff. But you can, you can go right down to the pixel level if you want to. And again, this is a, a generic JavaScript API you use to draw. It's not game specific, so you're not getting, you know, like a, a whole game loop or something like that. It's just really raw, basic, I want to blit pixels to, you know, a raster surface. It's not vector, it's, it's an array of pixels. You guys can ask questions at any time. I'm totally cool with that. Are you doing that high level or should we drill into them right now? Questions? Are you going to circle back with the low levels like on audio or are we right now? Am I going to, well, uh, I wasn't actually going to get that detailed on, on how you actually use the audio tag, but I could do that. Sure. So it, it supports, um, that's one of the things where the browser differences start to, to matter. So Firefox currently is, is Aug Vorbis. And I, and I think wa uncompressed wave are the only two formats they support. So you basically you do a game, you, you're, you're doing everything in MP3 and Aug Vorbis if you want to be cross browser. Basically, you're, you're stuck doing two encodings. Um, but they, so you, you got MP3, you got Aug, and then you have, un, you know, uncompressed stuff like wave. 
Um, and you can, you know, preload everything. You, you kind of go through a load cycle when your game starts and you kind of spool everything in. They have different kind of preloading so you can have stuff where it'll start playing once enough of it has streamed in for like a bigger background music track and that kind of thing. Uh, you, can, you can skip around in the tracks. So a lot of people are doing now what they call uh, audio spriting where they, they have like a bunch of audio all in one file and they just hop around inside of it. And you can't do multi-channel inside that one instance but, um, you know, it kind of loads faster and you, you don't have as much latency with um, triggering like a new audio object and stuff like that. Uh, but you can, you don't really have a problem with latency as long as you preload everything that you need. To do some of the multi-channel stuff, it's, it's still a little bit crude because a lot of times you'll have to like create uh, multiple instances of a sound object if you want to like, you know, duplex it or whatever. So if you want to have like the same exact boom sound play five times, you might need to have five instances of that boom sound. Otherwise, if you hit play again, it's going to jump back to zero and just cut. Yeah. Okay. Um, any, and just raise your hand if you have any question at any point. I'll try and spot so you. Also the yeah. Uh, audio spec that they're mm -hmm. out. Is there another one that I'm thinking of too that involves convolution and FFTs for audio? Well, the, the two big, um, you know, I guess I'd say the two big innovators in terms of browser technology are Mozilla and then WebKit, which is Chrome and Safari. Um, and I know that WebKit's trying to play catch up in that space and, and have like a fully featured, because Mozilla's pushed it back to the, the standards body. They've said, you know, hey, we developed this cool audio API, you know, push it back to the W3C and say, what do you think? And, and so I, I think that, um, you know, in a couple of iterations of these browsers, you'll see something that lets you do lower level stuff like, you know, change the pitch and all that kind of, yeah. yeah. It's, not, it's not quite there yet, though. Good. It's good to get that background. Yeah. How those maneuvers are working. Yeah, absolutely. Good questions. Um, okay. I'm sorry? Yes. Yep. So uh, they have a function where you can just grab, you know, a chunk of, a chunk of a bitmap from one file and, and blit it into your surface. Otherwise, you can do low-level stuff where you're working with raw pixel data. Um, and, and I mean, it supports pings with alpha transparency, so it's actually really easy to do sprites. You can have like an alpha transparent sprite and a ping in, in 2D and just blit it into your surface and it handles everything for you really easily. But, um, you know, if you wanted to get really low level and work at a pixel level, um, you know, so that you can control your color channels or stuff like that, you can certainly do that. Um, you know, it's got 32-bit uh, color plus a full alpha channel, so you can, for each pixel, you can manipulate that. Um, all right, so I think that more or less covers uh, Canvas. So I want to jump in and, and show you it in, in action. I mean, why not, right? So uh, I, I recently made this game. There was a, if you guys have heard of the Experimental Gameplay Project, every month they, they uh, do a theme-based contest. So basically you have seven days to make a, a game for their theme, and their theme a couple months ago was a cheap clone. So I did like a cheap running, glunt, uh, running gun kind of uh, Contra style game. For this, um, this is canvas and the audio tag for the, the visuals and for the sound. And uh, I used something called the Akihabara engine, which is a, a JavaScript based uh, video game engine that I'll talk about a little bit more. So I'm just going to quick uh, show you what this game is all about. All right. So there's your load cycle, it's pretty quick. It's going to be hard to play and hold a controller. I mean, a mic. Okay. It's also difficult to play uh, platformers without a gamepad. So, you know, you've got your kind of basic uh, shoot em up kind of game here. And so. Being that it's a cheap clone, the, the thanks, this would be perfect. Hey. All right, so uh, this is probably directional. Huh? Being that it's um, a cheap clone, the kind of joke was that the, like, the monsters are all cheap too, so you're like just battling like targets to shoot. This is kind of a, like, the gag here. Um, so I've got, you know, like, uh, several layers of parallax in the background and a tile based tile based map. It's uh your, your pretty standard uh kind of contra style game. 
I kind of want to play it to the end because it's rather hilarious. Here, I'll just run through it. You guys call Marvel at my playing skills on the keyboard. Yes. Thank you. This is my first uh, full walk cycle of a 2D character without using a template. Alright, so then, uh, yeah, the kind of you big for this the boss fight, yes. Yeah, so. Yes. Dead. Alright, well, anyway, it's, it, it's actually only one level, so I'm not gonna make you sit through it, but, um, I'm sure you do want to see. Well, there's a URL there. <laughs> yeah, but if you want to play through it, honestly, you can, you can jot that down. Or I think the, the slides, I'm going to give them uh, to Ryan, right? Okay. Yeah. And so you, we'll have all the URLs there, too. So uh, you can you definitely play. It's just the one level. Um, you know, like I said, I did it in like a week. Uh, it, was, uh, it was what I, the project I used to learn this Akihabara engine. It's, it's pretty pretty decent engine. I'll get into that more in a little bit. Um, yeah, yeah, and that will be the very next thing I talk about. And then uh, this was the game actually uh, that I presented um, the first time that Zach had me come talk here. Uh, I had done a game for a, a Boing Boing contest. They had this game inspired by music uh, competition where you had to like make make the game for the chip tune rather than make a game and then get the chip tune. It was like you can do it backwards. And so this. Um, probably very difficult to see because the game's called Infiltration at Dusk, so it's getting progressively darker the longer... Oh, that's not bad, actually. All right, so um, this is another canvas-based game, and this one has uh, real-time 2D lighting effects, so I'm kind of using masking and stuff to, um, to do 2D... Don't hit the command key. To do the lighting. And it's a keyboard masher, so wherever you kind of mash on the keyboard is where you fire, and it gets kind of hectic the longer you play, so... Um, but the kind of unique thing about this is, is uh, it's showing up you know, your ability to do some of the kind of more sophisticated kind of pixel level manipulation in the drawing surface that lets you kind of, um, you know, you can draw a background and then put a mask over it and cut parts of the mask out to control your like lighting levels and stuff like that. So, anyway. Alright, so, and this one also you can play online if you're so inclined. It has a high score table. So, to uh, Zach's question, uh, these work in Safari, they work in Chrome, they work in Firefox, they work in Opera, and they do work in Internet Explorer 9. Hey, Internet Explorer 9! Yay! So, um, yeah, you know, Internet Explorer's, uh, bless their hearts, has, you know, finally decided to come around a little bit. Um, and, uh, yeah, but it probably sucks in IE, right? And no, actually, it doesn't. It, they're using DirectX hardware acceleration in the Canvas, and they have one of the so they have one of the fastest Canvas implementations that's available right now. Um, I've I've tested my games in virtualization on a Mac, and they run faster than like Safari runs it without the virtualization layer. You know, like I'm running like Windows 7 on my Mac in virtualization, and, and yeah, the DirectX uh, just goes straight to hardware to the graphics card, and it's pretty impressive. Uh, so, yeah, good point. How, what is the performance of the canvas tag? Um, honestly, in a, in a you know, quote unquote desktop environment, your desktop, your laptop, it's, it's really good. Um, you've got hardware acceleration to a, a, a big extent in Chrome and IE9 in particular, uh, with the hardware acceleration being slightly better on Windows than Mac in my experience. And then uh, Safari and Firefox have, have some level of hardware acceleration, but like they don't have full on like this is you know, a hardware managed drawing surface and I'm offloading all of my drawing operations to it. But they're getting there really quickly. You know, neither, neither the Mozilla Foundation nor, uh, you know, Apple likes being behind anybody in these things. So it's, it's, with Safari it's probably 5.1 or 2, whatever the next Safari will probably have it. And um, I don't know, uh, Firefox claims, like they had this big article where they were kind of point for point saying, you know, Microsoft is full of crap and ours is hardware accelerated. But, um, Nonetheless, they're not quite 
they're not doing like the same level of direct hardware access. I think because Microsoft, you know, owns DirectX, I think they could kind of sneak in with Inter with Internet Explorer to kind of uh, you know make stuff work a little bit faster. Um, so I want to qualify very good a little bit, and rather than like show you some sort of you know demo where I'm drawing thousands of sprites to the screen or something, I thought I could use it like actual games as an analogy. So you could use Canvas for a desktop game or a laptop game, and you could do Tiny Wings or Angry Birds or Super Mario World or Zelda Link to the Past. You could do all those 60 frames a second, no problem. I mean that's you know that's where you are. So you could do a really I use two examples which are very popular casual games in the iOS market or um, you know you could probably do better than Super Nintendo. That's just kind of I just picked two games you'd be familiar with. But um, in, in terms of making a 2D game it's, it's, it's very good where it is right now. Um, so moving on a little bit, what about the physics part of Angry Birds? If I'm assuming you've all probably are one of the hundred million people who've played Angry Birds by now, but um, Angry Birds is a physics based, based game. You throw the birds and they smash into stuff and the blocks fall down uh, using 2D physics. Um, but Canvas is just a, a raw drawing tool. So like you've got to create your own game loop and listen to the user inputs and if you have a physics based game you have to implement your own physics. Um, and this is where the fast JavaScript engines really come to the rescue. It's because the browsers now have all done this like just in time compiling and all this stuff, they've really made floating point math very quick. And there's actually two ports of uh, box 2D physics uh, to JavaScript. I think it started in C and then went to action script for Flash and someone actually just did like a, uh, a machine, one, the first person just did like a machine port of action script to JavaScript. Um, didn't do it by hand, and then somebody else started like a GitHub project and and did another port of Box 2D physics. So um, for for physics and JavaScript, most people are using Box 2D, but uh, maybe Chipmunk will be a possibility someday. I'd be happy to see that. Um, so I just want to show like where where physics are kind of at right now um, in the JavaScript world. So this is actually I want to go back to. So, so this is um, a little jetpack kind of game demo here, and you can see it's got physics on the bullets and on these boxes. So your basic kind of 2D game physics. This uh, this demo is done with an engine called Impact. Um, everything's being drawn in the canvas, and uh, like I said, box 2D physics is a JavaScript. Uh, Port of the physics library. Impact's, um, I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit more later, but it's like a $100 one time fee. It's a commercial product rather than Akihabara, which is uh, actually a free product. Um, and this runs, I mean, you could abuse this a lot more on the desktop. This isn't even really trying it at all. Um, you know, you could, do, you could do bigger objects and a lot more of them, and you'd have perfectly decent 2D physics here. Uh, And, um, and I have another physics demo I'll show you here. This is one I did. Now this one's, um, it's not truly a game, but it's an interactive thing. And, and this one doesn't actually use Canvas to do any of the rendering. This is uh, using um, HTML and CSS3 to do the rendering, and then Box2D to do the physics. And I'm going to get into a second about why, you know, you wouldn't want to do everything in Canvas. So here, let me, let me show you. So here you've got like 3D cubes that, don't drag the windows Zach. You've got 3D cubes that are being, you know, manipulated in 2D space. So the physics is 2D but the, the drawing is 3D. And so you can toss these things around all you want. Um, you know, this is pretty simple, simple physics. The, the ports of Box 2D actually do handle, you know, everything that typically a 2D physics engine handles. It, you know, it does circles and different odd shaped objects and springs and, and that kind of thing. Um, so you don't have to be, you don't even have to be this simple with it. Um, so like I said, this isn't drawn with canvas. So I'm not like, uh, you know, I'm not, I don't have like a JavaScript uh, 3D renderer here where I'm drawing, you know, I'm doing all the 3D math and drawing into a 2D surface. This is, this is an HTML and CSS um, that does this. I could actually show you here. So like, um, if you look at the code, you know, you're defining the six sides of a of a cube, 
as HTML tags, and then you've got uh, these kind of magical CSS properties that actually let you do rotation in 3D space. Um, so it's it, basically the reason why you'd ever want to do that. Um, there's a few of them. I mean, basically, uh, sometimes it's better to to kind of skip the whole canvas thing because the the HTML and CSS is a bit higher level, so it can speed up your development cycle. Actually, depending on your game, some things are just not possible with it. But if your your game is possible within the realm of HTML and CSS, it's there's such high level tools that you can kick stuff out really rapidly. Um, like it would have been a lot more work to do a 3D rendering engine for cubes than to just tell the browser, hey, make me a cube. Um, there's also more backwards compatibility with HTML and CSS based games because uh, the canvas tag only works in like IE9, but HTML and CSS based games, you go have a game for IE8 or IE7. Um, maybe the most compelling reason is that it can actually outperform canvas in the mobile space um, in iOS. So like my demo with the, the 3D cubes that you can throw around, that runs really well. Um, in uh, like on an iPhone that runs really well, but if you were to write your own 3D renderer and, and render into a canvas, it would be really, really slow. Well, CSS3 is the newest spec of, it's like the newest version of CSS. Right. So like the kind of 3D cubes I made with CSS, you could only do with browsers that support that and that's like a new CSS3 property. Um, so no, unfortunately, like you can't just make a game with JavaScript and HTML5 and it will for sure work on an iPhone. You know, that's like something you might kind of naively think, but there's a lot of it depends um, to do something like that. Um, the gotchas for doing an HTML5 game and, and using it in a mobile, mobile environment, there's quite a few of them. The audio tag is crippled in mobile web browsers. Um, like basically if you load something on your iPhone in a browser, um, it'll only basically do a background track and that's only like after the user takes some action. Like you can only, you can only trigger a sound based on like the user actually clicking on something or giving some like direct input. You can't, you can't programmatically generate sounds. You can't have like two sprites shoot each other and create a, a, a boom sound effect. It's just how they've defined it. Um, and I, I think it's because they want to avoid, you know, people being on their phones on a website and having some gimmicky audio, you know, ads or whatever popping up. They, they think they want to mine people's battery and bandwidth, so they don't want people dumping all this audio on them. But it's unfortunately crippled um, mobile-based, mobile web browser-based games with audio. A canvas is really slow and not hardware accelerated on mobile devices. Um, so. You can, you can still do games with Canvas, but you have to have small sprites, not very many parallax layers. Like there's a lot of kind of compromises you have to make. Um, and to the point I was kind of making just a second ago, HTML and CSS actually, ironically in a way, are, are hardware accelerated on an iPhone and an iPad. So if you, uh, if you make all your sprites in your game like little HTML divs with background images or whatever, you can you can like translate those across the screen with like affine transformations and that's all dumped to the, the graphics card and all hardware accelerated and works really well but if you try to ma animate all those sprites in the canvas, um, you know, you're going to use up a lot of CPU and battery on, on the eye devices right now. Um, one kind of subtle thing is that you don't want to use mouse events on iOS, you want to use touch events. So you might make this amazing game and then you try and use it on your iPhone and it just doesn't work right because you've used you know, mouse events or keyboard events or whatever that you have to think about the context you're in because people, you know, play games by touching on the iPhone. They don't use a mouse. They don't use the keyboard. So you have to kind of account for that in your input loop. Um, and you pretty much have to give up the idea of physics if you're going to go uh, make a game in HTML5 for mobile. Like Box2D is, is, you maybe could do like 10 boxes and it would be pushing it. Um, the math heavy things are just too slow in JavaScript um, on mobile devices right now. Is there a multi-touch uh, thing that can be used across different browsers? Yes, there is a multi-touch API. So you certainly can do like, you know, as many multi-finger gesture inputs to your game as you want, which 
actually means you could do some kind of novel, you know, casual games with new input things and, and build them with JavaScript. You don't have to do it in like Objective-C. You, you have low-level access to the touch inputs. And it sounds like there's a lot of problems and like, you know, oh, I, I guess you can't make a mobile game with HTML5, but um, there's actually a ton of games you can still make even within the limitations and there's, um, there's like commercial, an actual commercial marketplace that's farming around this. There's a few companies that have popped up that are soliciting games from people and, and paying pretty well uh, to do, you know, clones of like Frogger and Bejeweled and some of these games which you can totally do within the limitations and, and rather than it being, you know, a, a flash based economy on the, bro in like the desktop browser, it's a, an HTML5 based game economy um, in uh, the mobile space and they, uh, they make their money by ads, I imagine, or something like that. Um, but yeah, there's these kind of HTML5 game publishers that have popped up. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about tools to help you uh, use some of this technology. I don't know if this is hopefully getting picked up. Um, all right, so one of the tools I mentioned was uh, Aki Hibara. Uh, so this is the URL for it. Um, this is a Canvas based game library, so it uses Canvas to do all its drawing and the audio tag to do all the audio. Uh, this one's both free and open source MIT licensed, so you have a ton of flexibility to do whatever you really want with it. Um, one of the cool things about it is, is uh, it comes with a ton of examples of uh, different games you could make. Actually, just uh, since I have the benefit of network, I'll pop it up here. So uh, these are all the example games you just kind of get for free. They're like kind of, it almost becomes a framework because you have all these example games you can just start within the, the kind of box they give you. So they have a classic platformer, they have a kind of, um, what do they call it, uh, a belt shooter where it's like scrolling up into the screen of the spaceship shooter. It's got a, a Zelda clone, uh, Tetris, Pac-Man, it even has a rhythm game. So you, you just kind of get out of the box all these different examples which really help you spool up really quickly to make uh, a game that's in one of these kind of, one of these kind of genres here. Um, the performance is really good on the desktop and actually, um, uh, what did I do? Where did my, there we go. So um, it actually does, it supports mobile web out of the box actually. Um, all those demos that they have of all the different genres, you can pull those up on an iPad or an iPhone and they run really well uh, because they've limited the, the, they don't have a lot of parallax going on where you have like big layers being moved um, and they're using smaller sprite and tile sizes which are the two biggest things to kind of make Canvas uh, not chug along on, in an iOS environment. Um, so it's kind of neat. You can make a game with Akihabara and it, and it kind of comes with on screen, it just has built in on screen like D-pad and XYZ buttons and you can, you can do a game and it works really well. Um, as long as you kind of, I mean you can break it by adding too many graphics or giant sprites or whatever and it'll start slowing down. Impact which I also mentioned, um, this is another canvas based tool. Now this one's commercial so it's a $99 flat fee, there's no like royalties or anything like that, it's just a one time fee. Um, and it does support plugins and custom modules. Um, so you can extend it and there's people in the community that do that. It comes with a visual uh, level editor which is, you know, kind of nice. You can, you can do, uh, it's a tile editor so you can like kind of draw out your map and put in events and stuff like that. Um, and this is the one where box 2D physics is already plugged in. So I showed you the jetpack demo with the guy shooting the bullets that's pushing the boxes. That's just something that comes with the library. They have that all wired up already for you. Um, this one also supports uh, mobile web out of the box. And what's interesting actually is the guy who made this uh, made a tool called Im uh, iOS Impact or Impact iOS where he's um, kind of wrote a tool that will automatically port your, your JavaScript and Canvas game to a native iOS app that uh, still uses JavaScript for the AI and the like in-game logic but um, it does all the graphics rendering in OpenGL so he's kind of like written a wrapper that takes all what should be JavaScript canvas calls and turns them all into OpenGL calls. So you get um, you know, a little bit more flexibility in, in your performance and, and graphics with impact. Um, it works pretty well. I mean it's still really, he just kind of just did like an alpha of it but um, I think he continue, he'll continue to support it. I think it'll be a pretty strong tool. Um, so talking a little bit about how you can take an HTML5 game and, and package it as an actual bona fide native iOS app, I want to talk about other distribution options with HTML5 games. I mean the obvious thing is you can just 
release it through a browser. You can make a game that's browser based and put it up on a site or find a distributor. Uh, there's like html5games.com and just like there's these big you know, flash based sites like Congregate and stuff, they're starting to pop up for HTML5 games. So you can, you can push your game out browser based that way. I'm actually thinking that, that Congregate and Newgrounds and stuff will, will come around and realize that they should also support HTML5 games within, those, uh, within their communities. Um, I think it's only a matter of time before they really just bite the bullet and do that. They don't right now, though, everything's still flash there. Um, but there's other options. So one product is uh, Titanium, and this is free and open source, and it will let you package your HTML5 game uh, as a native executable for Windows, Linux, Mac, Mac App Store, iOS App Store, Android, and I think they're even getting into like Blackberry and stuff. Um, you know, basically the way that it works from a technology standpoint is it just takes a uh, takes the source code of, of WebKit, a, a browser rendering engine, it sticks all of your 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 JavaScript code and everything into that, and then it just wraps a native shell around it. So it's your your kind of web view is just a, like a UI view inside of a native application is how it works. Um, but it, I mean, it works fine. I, the, in the desktop, you get the same performance you'd get out of like Chrome, which is uh, you can do really good games. And then uh, in the mobile space, it uses the the uh, WebKit that's built into the phone. So you, whatever mobile Safari can do, your your app can do. Um, and then there's a bunch of other ones that are just like this. Phone Gap is basically titanium, just by a different publisher. There's one called NimbleKit. You can also distribute your game through the Chrome Web Store. So Chrome has this whole marketplace they started that's like browser-based, and you can publish your game in the Chrome Web Store, and then people who have Chrome can, you know, pay through Google Checkout or whatever to buy your game and play it in their browser. Um, I know there's at least one. I don't know where they're out of, but there's a studio called Lost Decade Games that has been blogging a lot about their attempt at monetizing a HTML5 game through the Chrome uh, web store. And they, they also published it on the Mac app store and they said their Mac app store sales were almost nothing and their Chrome web store sales were really good. So I don't know what that means. Um, and then just a reminder that Impact, you can go from Impact to iOS as a native app too. Um, so I haven't said much about 3D games. <laughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit about WebGL just quickly. So uh, I kind of started off with this. WebGL is an implementation of OpenGL in the browser. Um, it's actually a different context for Canvas. Like when you create a Canvas, you say give me a 2D context or not, you can say give me this WebGL uh, context. So this is a hardware accelerated and really low level. Um, like I said, they've, they've done Quake 2 uh, that runs totally fine in WebGL. Um, and if you really, if you really like GL and you're really familiar with it, you'd be totally at home. I mean, it's got shaders and all the other I mean, it's GL. Um, so I haven't had a ton of chance to play with it, mostly because my GL skills are not very strong. But <laughs> um, it's, I mean, people are doing incredible things with it. It's, it's, it kind of blows me away. Um, but, you know, as spiffy as it sounds, right now it's only Chrome 10 and 10 Plus and, and Firefox 4 Plus are the only places that have it. Um, although Safari, the very next full point release of Safari will support it. Um, you can actually like turn it on manually in Safari right now, but you have to like go through some special menu to do it. So you, it's not like you can't publish a game that way because people will be like, "Why well, doesn't work?" Um, and then Opera says they're going to support it, but uh, there's not a real clear timeline there. And this is one of those things where there's no love from Internet Explorer and there's no love on iOS. Um, so WebGL is is pretty hardcore, but it's going to be a while before you can use it in every browser. Um, yeah. They just have not. So IE10 is coming out really quickly, which is rare for them to do another browser so quickly. They're they're speeding up their release cycle, but they haven't announced WebGL for IE10 either. So it's kind of ambiguous as to when or if they're going to join the party. Anything else you should know? Um, well, yeah. One one thing I want to also talk about is it's called WebSockets. Um, so this brings network I/O. So you can do multiplayer games. You could do you know just a two-player game or massively even a massively multiplayer game uh, through your browser. Uh, this is a low-level network I/O. You, you can create sockets and talk whatever protocol you want. Um, well, I shouldn't say that because on the on the server side you have to have like this gateway that. Uh, 
like the the server has to talk web web sockets like the connection has to be specific but then you can do whatever you want once you've done the handshake um, and you can do that you can use the the web sockets in Safari you can use them in Chrome they actually do work in iOS which is pretty neat um, and Firefox supported them and then stopped supporting them because of security problems. Apparently they're really nervous about some security issues with uh, having browsers being able to open socket connections. Um, but they're going to, they, apparently they've worked it out and they're going to re-enable support shortly. Um, uh, no love in Internet Explorer. For Actually yes yet. there is. Up here. Internet Explorer has websites? Um, there is, you can download a plugin that Microsoft has put out. There, it's it's their out of band that they're working on for IE 10. It's actually been out for IE 9 since the IE 9 RC came out. Okay. Um, I think it's HTML5labs.com or something like yeah. that. Microsoft also ha they have a couple other HTML5 plugins that you can download for IE 9 to get kind of beta level support for some of the things they're working on for 10. Very cool. Okay. Yeah, and I, there's also a, a flash shim for this. You can go to like if you Google like socket.io or something, there's basically this thing you can drop in that does web sockets if they're supported or bridges everything through Flash, which can create sockets otherwise. Um, so you can actually kind of do network IO and JavaScript uh, pretty reliably. There's this website called caniuse.com, which is really neat. You can just type in any technology that's web related that you want into it and it'll tell you full spread of what browsers support it, when it, you know, how long they've supported it and all of that. It's a pretty cool tool. Um, one kind of closing thought I want to add is that um, I was thinking about this the other day. You know, there's like some games where you would maybe not be able to release them today and get the performance that you want. But considering the browser vendors have been, you know, ramping up the speed of of their implementations by like sometimes 100% in six months, it's like if you have a six month or 18 month dev cycle, all of a sudden JavaScript becomes a hell of a lot more compelling as a language to make a game in. Um, because there's a lot of opportunity to, to produce stuff very rapidly because it's a higher level language and you can also target multiple platforms um, you know which you can I guess you can do with other tools you can do it uh, with unity to an extent and you can you know supposedly do it with Java although I always hear that there's there's more myth to that than truth from some people but I, I don't know not a Java person um, but yeah I, I think that uh, I'm pretty impressed with where it's at now, and, and I really I think it's only going to get better and better. Yeah. Um, yeah. There we go. I got two things I wanted to touch on. Um, SVG. Yeah. Have you looked at that at all? Probably tell people what that is. Yeah, sure. And then the other thing is IP protection, intellectual property. All yes. of this, it's JavaScript. Great question. Your browser downloads it. People can debug it uh -huh. and step into your code. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> the IP protection one is is nasty because uh, I mean you can op obfuscate, you can run it through like Google Closure and it will mangle it. But at the end of the day, um, you know somebody's still got something that's code and not you know it's not even byte code, it's code. Um, they can try and demangle it and they'll have they'll have quite a bit of your IP. Um, the other place where that really gets to be a pain is with like high score tables. Just like with like high score tables, because um, you know you you want to be able to talk to a server and say like you know I got this score in the game, but you can't trust the client. Plus, people can manipulate the client, you know. So it's like you're you're always trying to stay a step ahead of people who are going to take the time to look and see how the high score mechanism works and put in their own scores and stuff. And, and honestly, That's like yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, anytime you can like see the the network traffic, you have an opportunity there. But I mean, with with JavaScript, it's like unless you're going to like implement like public private key encryption and like JavaScript or something, I don't. I, there's nothing you can really do. You know, like you'd have to. Yeah. It's, so it's like there's there's really nothing you can do. I mean, like the only thing you could ever do if you really wanted to like stop any sort of like score cheating or any of that stuff is you'd have to constantly be hitting a remote server with everything that the user is doing so that the the server is keeping an instance of the game so that if all of a sudden you know the the player says they killed 10 enemies and they're you know but that those events never happened and they don't check out on the server side but i mean that'd be crazy you'd be running an instance of the game server it'd never scale so you know it's uh i don't know like 
I don't know what that means, you know, for the, I mean, if you package something as a native app, then uh, people have to, like, decompile to get code, um, and supposedly there's some ways to, to kind of mitigate that, but if you're publishing in the web, then people really do have pretty, uh, it's, it's a big question that yeah. the browser vendors need to figure out, or the HTML group needs to yeah. figure out, because that is going to be a, a major deterrent for commercial gaming. Yeah. Probably. Probably will. <laughs> I forgot, there, there's a first part of your question, I forgot. SVG. SVG. Yeah, so SVG is, is scalable vector graphics. Um, and you, you can do, I mean, just like you can do a game with HTML and CSS, or you can do a game with Canvas, you can do a game with SVG and then you have a, a vector-based game, which is kind of neat. Um, I haven't seen a ton of people doing games in SVG, though. I've seen a few, but not, I think it's just marketing more than anything. I think there's so much marketing behind HTML5 and Canvas that that's yeah. where all of the development's happening. Yeah, the, some of the advantages I've seen in SVG is it is vector, mm -hmm. so supporting the multiple devices becomes much easier. And it does have JavaScript interfaces for it, and right. it's very flexible. Yeah. You can change things on the fly within it. Yeah. Um, there's a SVG Girl um, cartoon anime demo yeah. that yeah. was done all in SVG, and you can go and change the colors and have it rerun. It was extremely impressive how much they had running on the screen. And I just, I was just wondering if you had looked at using that for anything or yeah. seeing any other games that have used it. And I know like SVG has like within the language spec it has events and animations and stuff so you can like have an SVG sprite that inside of the sprite itself it knows how to animate itself and it like gets kind of offloaded to the browser and you don't have to think about it. So there's some kind of neat aspects to SVG for sure. Um, but I, I just don't have that much experience with it myself. You've been waiting patiently. So as far as like IP yeah. Yeah. If you've ever used a decompiler, they work really well. Sure. Like basically you have all the methods. <coughs> well, Flash too. I mean, you can you can reverse uh, decompile Flash pretty effectively. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I say that it's only probably going to affect commercial, I mean I think some of the big studios will probably be scared off, but if there's money in it, if people are making money, they're, they're going to keep developing. You know, and it's like, you, even, if you, even if everyone can see your code, you still own the graphics, you still own the sound, you still own all the levels that you've designed, and it's like, people are going to rip off your game regardless if it's a good idea. So, and they can't use your code verbatim because then that would be uh, copyright infringement. So like, you know, it's, it's, yeah, you give them a leg up, but they're gonna copy you if you have a good game anyway. Well, I, I think some of the other things against that is the ease of entry for hacking a game is so much, it, it's right there in the browser, you can just debug it. Compared to the other things, you do have to go and run other things, so script kiddies could come back. Yeah. And also then people can like make these extensions for the browsers to hack your game and mm -hmm. fun stuff like that. So it gets to be extremely, it gets to be, you have to put more time into trying to fight the people trying to game your system because it becomes so much easier for them to do that. So yeah. I, I think that, I, I really hope for some sort of packaging system that can help it to be secure within the browser system. Yeah, I mean it, it makes sense to an extent. They're already doing like just-in-time compiling, so why not do that ahead of time? And then you've got byte code, and it's at least a little bit more of like a step for people who want to steal your code. But uh, I don't know. I don't know if, especially with Google doing like the web store, there might be incentive for them to do some sort of compiled format or something for those. But I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Although, again, any compiled format is going to have all the important names and yeah. code still there, and any bytes code can easily yeah. you know, put back in yeah. a lot more. I think the point he's making is you, you, know, you can just get on the console right now and just like, you know, start tweaking the values inside of variables in real time and stuff like that. Be like, score equals one million. 
You know, like, you can totally do that. I mean, you can, you, you wrap all your code in a Lambda function and then it's no longer in a global scope and it makes it a little bit harder because then you actually have to use a debugger and like put in like, you know, breakpoint and then change the values because you can't just go on the console and say score equals whatever. But if, if someone knows what they're doing, they can really mess with your, your JavaScript game a lot, you know. But I don't know if it's a bad thing. I mean, in some ways it's, it's flattering. If people want to take the time to reverse engineer your, your obfuscated code and like make some thing, I mean, it could be free press for your game, you know. It's like, it's only when it stops making it fun that it really, if it's multiplayer and someone's, you know, taking the fun out of it by some nasty cheat, then it's like, what do you do? But, um, I do have uh, another, one other demo here. So, uh, something to take with you in your HTML5 game making quest. So, um, are you guys familiar with uh, Ludum Dare? Yeah, it's a 24-hour a game making challenge. So I, I did that. I li did Ludum Dare 20, and I made a game uh, with HTML5 for that. And I just wanted to share oh, it. Uh, like four times a year, or something like that now. Yeah, and they and they do mini dares now, which are like 24-hour things that don't have as much of a you know press thing around them and stuff like that. All right, so. I use Aki Habara for this again. So the theme was it's dangerous to go along. Take this was the actual the theme for Ludum Dare. So I made like a a really old school like puzzle game. Like the graphics are almost like uh, ZX Spectrum or something like that. Um, so you've got your little link guy and this kitten. So I, I actually combined the, the It's Dangerous to Go Alone from Zelda 1 with the meme from the internet where the guy's got a kitten that he's given to you. So I put those two together. And then uh, It's Dangerous to Go Alone in quotes. So you've got your guy and there's a toilet and toilet paper and then you've got your kitten and there's a bag of litter and a litter box. So you've got to kind of, you have to navigate these two together. So you've got to like go here and pick up your, pick up your toilet paper and your litter. And then you have to get the cat into the cat box and you into the, the toilet. <laughs> and then it gets harder, so now there's like lava, right? So you gotta, and you have to mind what the cat's doing while you're doing your thing, so you don't steer the cat into the lava kind of thing. And they get uh, progressively harder. Yeah. Even more lava. Oh, I just, I, man, this is my own game and I just screwed myself. Watch what's going to happen here. All right, so I'm going to try and get over there without killing my, oh, man. <laughs> it's been a while since I played. All right. So I'm going to get over there, but I hose myself because I, uh, I got the toilet paper first, so now I can't get the litter. So now I gotta drive the kitten to the lava. <laughs> but yeah, so that's this is the the basic uh, the basic idea. So I've gotta get this first, and now I can I can steer my kitten over here, and I can go and get this, and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, you get the idea. <laughs> All right. Well, that's uh, that's the nice my slides anyway. But I'm happy to talk more, or answer questions, or or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, well, there is something smarter now, so, um, but of course it's not supported by every browser. So the typical way to do it is you either set an interval or you, or you um, so you can set an er interval and say every, uh, you know, 60 times a second run my draw function. Um, or you can do it the other way where you, um, you, you have two things going on, where you have one, you have like a, a time fixed loop where it, it calculates how much time has gone since the last one and runs as many iterations of your, your collision and all that stuff to update the game and, and then draw a frame. Um, 
And then now there's this thing called uh, like animation frame ready or something like that. It's, a, it's an event that the browser generates and uh, Firefox and, and Safari and Chrome do it. Um, and basically the, the, every time the browser is going to paint, it uh, sends you this event. Um, and you put your, all your draw code in there. So you have, you know, your, you know basically uh, every time you get one of those I can draw events, you see how much time has passed and you, you update all of your objects as many times as they need to be updated and, and then you draw your frame. Um, and you're supposed to get it 60 times a second. Um, if you're doing a ton of crazy stuff in your game, you might only be able to draw, you know, 30 times a second. If your game is really simple, uh, you know, you might be drawing 120 frames a second. Um, and it's, it's also, it won't, it won't send the events if you're in a different tab or, you know, the browser is minimized or something like that, which is, uh, like on a laptop really nice because, you know, you might have a game running in the background that doesn't seem like it's doing anything, but it's painting the guy standing there 60 times a second and, and chewing up battery. But with this animation frame is ready thing, you can be in a different tab and that just shuts down all the painting. Um, and so that's kind of why you need to pay attention to how much time has elapsed because you might need to move a bunch of stuff when there's been 10 seconds that have gone by that it hasn't painted or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Using, yeah, you, yeah. I mean, you can you can certainly just look for a, a, a blur, a window blur event, which you'll, you'll fire if you switch out of a tab or or out of a window. Um, you can, and then you can just have some state variable that says I'm paused or whatever, and and throttle down your drawing yourself. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's in each each one of these engines some of them like handle some of the stuff for you and you know some offer you more tools than others you know they each kind of have their own approach to handling user inputs and draw loops and all these things um, you know so sometimes you have a bunch of nice functions out of the box that take care of this stuff for you and otherwise you're you know having to implement all that stuff yourself yeah you mentioned uh, titanium yeah Mm -hmm. Do you see that kind of moving forward or like going away if you can't, you know, compared to, you know, tapping into the actual native features on the phone? Like, mm -hmm. Do you think those kind of technologies are going to get better or kind of things a little I think they'll get better. I think, I think JavaScript's here to stay. I, honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if. I mean, I'm a little bit skeptical, but part of me really thinks that Apple's going to cave and just let people. Use JavaScript to write native apps out of the box. Um, you already can really easy. Right. Web view, web view, just, right. But but if you want to, from within that web view, if you want to um, check what the gyroscope is doing or uh, fire up something from the iPod or whatever, you have to bridge the from the JavaScript to the native app and then write all those native functions. What Titanium and PhoneGap do is they have these native. Uh, they expose all the native APIs in JavaScript. And actually, with uh, with PhoneGap, you do everything inside of your web view code. So, like, you write your game, and inside your your game JavaScript that's manipulating an HTML5 canvas, you'll have some, you know, like PhoneGap dot get me the gyroscope or whatever. But with with Titanium, they they've separated it. So you write your your native kind of application code in JavaScript in one file, and then if you want to render stuff into a browser view, you Create a browser view and then load in different JavaScript into that, and they're and they're so that way. What they're basically doing is they're having um, more access to like native UI elements and stuff, but with like JavaScript. Like you can create like a native table view or a native camera view or some of these. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. They basically like. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I get frustrated with titanium all the time because there's like uh, the oh well, I just the the documentation for it drives me crazy, but 
but uh, phone cap is pretty neat. Like I've I've run into walls with with uh, titanium before, where it was too much of a pain to to like recompile titanium to fix their bugs. Whereas with phone gap, it's creating like a it's so easy because it creates um, an Xcode uh, project, and you can see the phone cap uh, phone gap Objective C. So like if something's not working with phone gap, you can just tweak the Objective C and you know, but then you're starting to get to the point where it's like, well, why didn't I just write the whole thing and reject to see that? <laughs> you know, but but you know, it, it's sometimes it's so fast to, to kick something out in JavaScript, especially if you have come from a web development background and you're already familiar with using this stuff. You can you can kick out a game really quickly, um, you know, and as long as you're not trying to to you know make Battlefield Earth or something in JavaScript, you, you know, you can make a lot of games and they'll perform just fine, um, and you can and you can produce them pretty quickly. Although I, I know plenty of people who will actually like use something like titanium or impact to just prototype their game and do like a lot of play testing and kind of get some of their ideas fleshed out because it's so quick to iterate and then they'll like go to Cocos 2D or something to do the final product it's like they consider it like a you know play test and then they go into real development but i don't know i mean to to answer the original question i think that titanium and phonegap and nimblekit and all these tools will continue to evolve um and try and mitigate Whatever slowdown they have from being abstracted away from Objective C as much as they can. I know t Titanium is moving more and more towards letting you uh, open up the project in Xcode and, and stuff like that. Um, I, I don't know if they're actually thinking about compiling the JavaScript to Objective C. I mean, right now it's all interpreted, but um, I don't know. I think JavaScript's uh, the language to know right now, honestly. I, I don't know. I mean, any of like the Unity folks or some of the rest of you know a, a lot of these engines. Like, you you can do a lot of scripting in Python. I don't know if you can also. I think there's like a JavaScript dialect of some sort for Unity, also. Yeah. And Unity has a JavaScript dialect, yeah. but it's definitely not JavaScript. Not JavaScript. Okay. <laughs> like yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. Like, yep. You, so yeah. Yeah. It's a neat language. I mean, it's come a long way since, like, you know, Netscape three and so. I mean, the, the biggest difference in JavaScript now from back then is that a, a lot of the headaches with with cross browser compatibility are you know shrinking. You know, like you can write. JavaScript and it'll work in every browser without any problems these days. You don't have to have like all of these if I E do this. Like JavaScript's gotten pretty good. Now when JavaScript's talking to HTML or CSS or something, then you've got a problem. But the, the core JavaScript language has gotten pretty standardized. Have you looked at CopyScript You know, uh, I'm familiar with it. Um, is that's um, the one that you go from Java to JavaScript, right? The, yeah, no? It's, it's, I was thinking of Google's product then. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's a syntactic sugar for JavaScript, so it's just it's the same language, different syntax. It looks a lot more like Python, Ruby, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Python style indentation. Um, but it gives you a bunch of nice, helpful things like local vari variables are local by default, mm -hmm. and you have to just put it in local, so you don't put a var. Yeah, yeah. Or Cool. Coffee script, right? Coffee script, yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's a Right, 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 right. Yeah, I, sorry. I, I I thought you said something else because I always just think e ECMA or whatever. I never pronounce it. But yeah, yeah, the new, yeah, the 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 language spec that both ActionScript and JavaScript have kind of forked from. Yeah, because uh, yeah, ActionScript was what they were going to make ECMAScript for, mm -hmm. I believe, and yeah. then it was dissolved. But yeah, ECMAScript five is looking pretty nice. Um, I I nine has good support. Uh, 
uh, most of the WebKit browsers do. I think Opera has decent support for it. There have been a couple ECMA 5 only games shown off, but you get nice things like script mode, you get better um, scoping, and it's you, you can get a much more um, uh, much more terse language out of it. But do you know if they you have to um, watch out for older browsers because yeah. so, none of them like I. Uh, uh, Firefox 3.5 has some issues with it, and IE 7 and 8 don't have any support at all. Yeah. Do you know about any uh, performance differences with with 5? Have they like are they able to do funky optimizations with that language that they can't do with? Yeah, I think in strict mode, um, they're able to do much more um, optimizations on it hmm. because it gets rid of some of the the funky valuations that they have to work around. Yeah. So. Yeah. Oh, it'll be interesting. There was a. Does it have stronger types? Uh, a bit know? stronger, yeah. yeah. You can make you can make types um, sealed, if you want to. You can freeze them. Um, John Resig has a couple good posts. Cool. On ECMA five. Um, so, yeah, getters and setters, pr actual properties. Yeah. Um, uh, there was an interesting demo someone put up. I think it was last week, of JSIL. It's a, it's a .NET to JavaScript compiler. They took one of the XNA platforming demos. They just downloaded downloaded the demo from the the creator forum or the site and cross compiled it, threw it into um, in Canvas and using ECMAScript five, and it ran rather well. I had a, a friend run it on his iPad, and it ran. It was pretty nice. Huh. Very cool. All right. Well. Thanks. Thanks for listening. Thank you. You're welcome.